Welcome back to Genetics in the Paddock. I'm your host, Emily Johnston, and I'll be taking you along on my journey to learn about all things genetics in extensive livestock. Livestock genetics has always been a topic that's interested me, and now working in the genetic space, it's fascinated me even more with just how powerful of a tool it can be. And I'm surrounded by so many knowledgeable people who are so willing to share their insight, so I thought, why not capture these conversations on a podcast that we can all learn from? In this episode, I spoke with Brad Wormsley, a quantitative genetics research officer at New South Wales DPI. He unravels the science behind selection indexes and provides an overview of how they can help make informed decisions when purchasing livestock. So you want to stick around for this one. And with that, let's get into it. We've got Brad again as another special guest. Had Brad a couple of weeks ago. How are you going, Brad? Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. You've been busy with uh, Southern Multibreed Project you spoke to us a little bit about last couple of weeks ago. Always, always busy with that project. (laughs) Always something going on. So today we're going to talk a bit about selection indexes, which is Brad's bread and butter. Yep. So Brad, can you just tell us a little bit about what selection indexes are just to start us off? Uh, Selection index is a mechanism to put all the genetic information that comes from EBVs together into one number that signifies how a breeding animal, in most cases a bull or a ram, can influence profitability on farm through his progeny. So it's it's a way of condensing in Angus cattle, there's 25 EBVs, it's a way of condensing those 25 EBVs into one succinct number and it allows you to evaluate the impact on profit. And that's expressed as a dollar value? Yeah, dollar. In the case of beef, it's dollar per cow mated. In the price, in the case of sheep, it's dollar per ewe mated. So you said there was 25 traits within the Angus group. Yep. So how many of those traits actually go into each index? Is it the whole 25 or is it a certain amount of traits? Like how does it kind of break down into the index itself? Uh, no, it's not the whole 25. It's, a, it's a, most of them. Their structural traits don't go in there and their docility, EBV, doesn't go in. But the rest of the traits are considered within within the indexes. So everything from calving ease, birth weight, growth traits, the fertility traits, and the carcass traits. And so for those people who've and, never sorry, used... the feed efficiency traits. So for those people who've never used or seen an index, yep. what, what are some examples of some indexes that might be available to choose from? For someone who's never seen it, can you paint the picture of what... Oh, be at. it works exactly the same way as an EBV. So it's a comparison between animals. So you actually look at the difference between two animals to determine the, their effect. So it's no different in terms of how you use it to how you use an EBV. And some example, you know, my, all most breeds in Australia that are within the breed plan system have uh, indexes. You know, Herefords and Angus, and Brahmins, and they all tend to be tailored towards. The market that they're they're targeting, whether it's you know a, a long fed or a short fed or a grass fed or a, a grain fed, and increasingly more now people are targeting towards uh, the background of the production system. What's the costs in having the cow herd? There are ge- geographic differences in costs, so they're aligning indexes to different geographies. Some good examples recently: Brahmins just released their new version six breed object indexes. One is a live export index that really targets northern Australia and the Pilbara and the Kimberley, uh, really focused on fertility with the end market that they're targeting live export into Indonesian feedlots. They've produced a new index, which they call the Central Production Index, which is actually putting more emphasis on the growth traits to, to allow any animals that are coming down out of Queensland, northern Queensland into central Queensland, to have a higher growth potential and perform better in the feedlot. And they've lessened the pressure or lessened the emphasis that's placed on fertility without saying fertility is not important. They still still say fertility is important, but they've just put more emphasis onto the growth traits. You know, Angus are the same. They have indexes that are um, for their domestic market, their long-fed grain market, their heavy grass steers. And in each of those market derivations, they have a background production system that has a low cow feed cost, so they're happy to have big, bigger cows and, you know, feed is, is closer to being of low value, whereas their other version of the same index is they've got a production system described as having higher feed costs. They don't want their cows to be quite as big, more pressure on keeping cows at a, at a moderate size than getting bigger. And so 
they've created a, a swath of EBVs that target those that are happy to have big cows and target the various markets and those that want more moderate cows and target the different markets. Hereford's are the same. They've got a southern grass-fed Hereford base index and a northern grain-fed Hereford-based index, and same sorts of things that feed price differentiates the production system. They're really targeting higher MSA index carcasses, so higher marbling. There's so, a few for you. So it sounds like there's a variety of indexes that are available. And in that, you were talking about having emphasis on different traits. So does that mean that when we look at these indexes behind the scene, there's certain emphasis on different traits at different levels? Or are they all kind of grouped as the same? For example, different traits are weighted either the same or at different levels, like depending on what index you're using. Yeah. Kind of how does it kind of all come together to work in that sort of index? Yeah, well, we, we, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about a breeding objective and the information that you use to set a breeding objective, the same sort of information is used to set up the foundation of the indexes to say, in this type of cow production system with this targeted marketing point, these are the characteristics of production and costs and, and, and the type of income that could be generated from such a system. And then that allows... Um, you to put the appropriate emphasis on each of the traits. So we don't group the traits together and put the emphasis on them. We actually allow each trait to have its emphasis determined by its impact on the economics of the production system. So you know, a good example is the you look at the, the Wagyu's. They have what they call a self-replacing index and a Wagyu breeder index. Their target is heavy Wagyu carcasses with high marble scores. But what they want is one group of producers is more keen to achieve that through higher growth animals, so they put more emphasis onto their growth traits and, and slightly lessen the emphasis on their, their marbling-related traits. And in the other group, they're really focused on marbling, and so they put more emphasis onto their marbling traits and less emphasis onto their growth traits, even though in both instances they're still putting the right uh, pressure as in increasing marbling and increasing growth in both cases. They just do it at slightly different speeds for each trait. So in that, the production system behind each index is slightly different so that so they um, they put more weighting onto the growth in, say, the, the Wagyu breeder index because the marbling's valued slightly less, whereas the self-replacing index, the, the marbling value is higher. In the, in the Wagyu breeder index, they also have a lower feed cost for the cow herd as co- compared to the self-replacing index. And the same sort of thing applies to any of the, the breed society's indexes where there are differentials in the in the direction that each index is trying to go. And you mentioned before that there are new in- indexes coming out. Are there? Is that kind of something that's quite frequent? Like new index indexes are developed quite often, or are they updated often, or how does that kind of work? Uh, so there's been an, a number of indexes released over the last five years, and that's where uh, breed societies have been upgrading from an older version of software of breed object to the latest one that we've just you know, in the last five years we we've done a lot of updates and developments to the science. Um, so Wagyu's, I think it was 2019 from memory, if it's not, it was 18, we re- they released some in- the, the, their indexes, um, Herefords follow them, Brahmins follow them, Angus have followed them, various other breeds, Murray Grays, etc. are working on them now. So it depends on the breed society, some of them are very quick to take them up and want to move forward with new new things and, and push the envelope a bit. Some other some other breed societies tend to sit for a little while. And it also depends on the suitability. You know, some of them evaluate and think, oh no, they're still perfect for what we're trying to do as a breed society and a general breed, so they just stick with the same index for for longer. It's and like I said two weeks ago, it's changing indexes really down to how you view what the index is doing compared to what the targets are of the production systems or in a breed society's case what they're trying to do as a as a breed. So yeah, they come out you know, there's no one set answer. Probably Reviewing them should be done about every three years just to make sure the parameters that are behind the financial system that constructs the index is, is still relevant and it's not out of date. Um, but other than that, you know, if it works and it's going to keep working, then they stick with it. So when we spoke to Kirsk about breeding values and specifically how they're laid out in the table and how they're viewed yep. once a producer receives them or has a look at them in a catalogue, when I'm thinking about indexes, how how are they kind of laid out? So if I was a producer and going to use one of these, what am I going to see and how am I going to kind of view that? Is it, you know, all of your animals that you're interested in, are they lined up as a dollar value? Are they kind of ranked in terms of what might be best for that index? Or are they, I'm just curious as to how it looks once you're using that to make a decision. Well, it's a little bit up to... Um the in a sale situation up to the the vendor you know some of them 
are happy to put all the indexes there for everyone to look at. Some of them don't value some indexes, so they tend to, to stick to certain indexes. It just depends on the vendor as to how they present them in their particular catalogue. But as a general sense, generally the EBVs are presented in a block together, and then there's somewhat of another block adjacent to that somewhere, whether it's next to or just below, depending on the layout where they have the indexes identified. And then all indexes are dollar values, so the, the index dollar values are just presented against the index names. And as I said, it varies between some people present them in different orientations and all other ways. So when we're looking at, so say we've identified the index that's most suitable for our production, yep. is the highest dollar value always the best option? Uh, yeah, in a general sense. Um, if you are directly targeting the production system that aligns to that index, then yes. Obviously, there's some other considerations. Yeah, there's some there's some traits that aren't actually in the indexes, so that needs to they need to be taken into consideration too. And yeah, in a general sense, the highest dollar index value within an index is the best animal. You know, obviously, the index doesn't contain every trait that has some level of economic importance. So those traits that aren't in the index need to be considered at the same time relative to the dollar values. And beyond that, you also have to consider other things like the genetic conditions or you know, other attributes. So all those other slight externalities that aren't inside the actual index, you need to think about. Or if there's, I won't talk about it today, but if there are particular traits, like you might have a, a predefined value for, say, carving ease that you really can't accept. Maybe just say it's you don't accept any bull below zero for carving ease. Then you can do a form of ranking. But even once you've done that, the bulls with the higher dollar indexes are the better bulls for the production system that's described. Now, if people are seeing that that's not the case, then you need to question are they using the right index or is there an index that actually caters for their needs? Right. So, so when we look at that dollar value, does that dollar value mean how much you know it's going to make for that like per calf or how, how, because we spoke to Kirsty last week and she was saying, you know, once you see your breeding value, you take half of that because, you know, half yep. is passed from the sire and half from the dam. But how is how does that work for selection indexes? How do we see how much value we're going to make from that? Is it just halved or how does that kind of work? You compare the two of them. So you take half of, yes, the sire and half of the dam and put that together. And so if, if two sires are made into the same group of dams, the difference is half of the difference between the two sides. And so it applies, what you do with EBVs applies exactly to indexes. So the number you actually see, say it's 100, that doesn't mean that bull is going to make you $100. It just means that he's 100 and another bull's 90. The relative difference is 10 between the two of them. And they'll only pass on half of that. So the first bull was $5 better. His progeny would be $5 better on average than the other bull's progeny. Right, that makes complete sense. Yeah. So it's exactly the same as using an EBV. It's, it's a comparison between animals. It's not an absolute value itself. And what happens if there's not an index available that suits your production system? Uh, you simply need to find a different one or find, create one that actually suits your production system. So there is the facility to do customization of indexes. Um, some people use it, some people have tried it and then actually come to the realisation that what they're after is actually catered for in pretty much close proximity to what's catered, uh, provided by the breed societies. Um, so if, you, if you've if you gone through everything and found no indexes that actually fit your production goals, then the best option is to create a customised index. What kind of things do you need to think about when you want to customise your index? Is it just what's available, what your current inputs are, outputs, like kind of what goes into that customisation process? Um, it's exactly the same process as what happens when you are a breed society and you create a breed society index. So the, the same considerations about what affects commercial profitability, you know, levels of performance or production characteristics that might be problematic like calving ease or poor growth or, or need better marbling or something, thing, all those sorts of things are taken into consideration. So it's exactly the same process as a breed society doing it. Um, it's just that you would need to have some idea as an individual production system as opposed to letting the breed society do it. But the process is identical, whether it's a breed society published index or it's a customized index, it's exactly the same process to create one. Okay. 
It sounds like selection indexes can be quite useful and in the sense that they can also be used to identify your breeding objective or help steer you in the right direction of what you might be looking for for your production. Is that a fair assumption to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the index is the end of the cycle. So you start with your breeding objectives about what is it that's actually changing profit. You measure what you can in the seed stock herds and create EBVs and then you use those EBVs in alignment with your breeding objective to construct the index. So that the index is the final step to say, oh, well, we know we, know we want to change these traits to change profit. These are the things we've measured. Let's put it all together. This is the one number how we might change profitability if we selected that bull in the production system we described. So it's really the end of the chain in our breeding program. Okay. So what does it mean to have a terminal index versus like a self-replacing one? Uh, so when indexes are constructed, as I briefly touched on two weeks ago, they're aligned to the characteristics of the production system. So in some systems, they produce self-replacing females that come back into the herd. You know, so you get a, a stable cow population that comes from the bulls you buy. You have a terminal system where the bulls that are purchased only produce progeny that go to slaughter. And you can have a maternal, what we call a maternal system where what they're really only interested in is producing a line of females that have good maternal characteristics and they can then be mated to a terminal sire. And that's quite common in pigs and poultry, that sort of system. So you have a terminal and a maternal index that join together. So the differences are when it comes to indexes is a terminal index does not have any traits included in it that relate to on-farm cow production. So cow size, cow milk production, uh, cow fertility, cow calving ease. None of these traits are considered, whereas a a self-replacing index considers all the traits of both the cow and the progeny. So every single trait of economic importance is considered in a self-replacing index. And a maternal index, the focus is actually much more on the maternal traits, on maternal calving ability, milk, or what we call milk production, or the milk EBV, maternal size, fertility. Those traits are much more focused on in a maternal index, so they then can complement a, a terminal sire index when you put the two things together. So there are different types of indexes that if the production systems are different in their high level structure, that the indexes can cater for the fact that they don't keep heifers or they're only focused on producing good heifers, etc., etc. I think that's a fantastic explanation. I think it clears up the differences very well. So when we're looking at Angus indexes, what are the difference between dollar domestic and dollar domestic dash L? Oh, well, in Angus, they've I mentioned it earlier that they've created um, the situation where they've got two different cow production systems. One's got a lower feed cost and one's got a higher feed cost. And so the dollar D-L, or domestic with low feed cost, they're, they're indexes that are actually comfortable with allowing mature cow size to increase. The straight dollar D or dollar domestic is an index where they're more focused on having moderately sized Angus cows. And so there's a higher assumed commercial feed cost in the system, so that actually keeps the cow at a moderate level in terms of a size. The indexes sound like an amazing tool just to take out the complexity of it for the producer, like all of those important things that you might consider in your breeding objective or when you've benchmarked your herd, they're all just accounted for in an index and it seems to simplify that whole process a lot. So, mm. Oh, many of them are. There's still a few we're working on, including like future trace like methane, etc. so welfare. But... Yeah, we're doing as good as we can at the moment. So there'll be a future index for methane? There'll be future indexes that will hopefully include methane, yes, and include things like welfare. That sounds great. All right, thanks so much, Brad, for coming on for yet another episode. It's been great to chat to you about selection indexes and it's cleared up a lot of questions that I've personally had and I'm sure it's helped a lot of people understand how to use these tools better and, yeah, it sounds like a fantastic direction when you're looking from your breeding objective as well. So I appreciate your time today and I'm sure we'll see you on another podcast sometime in the future. No worries. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Brad. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily, a podcast produced by the Extensive Livestock Genetics team within New South Wales DPI. We hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the world of genetics and its impact on livestock production. If you found this episode informative and engaging, please consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review. Your feedback is essential in helping me to continue to bring you valuable content on livestock genetics. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future topics or guests, please don't hesitate to reach out to me on social media or through email. We love hearing from our listeners and are always eager to explore the subjects that matter most to you.